Atheist Nomads, episode 121, interview with Jamila Bay. The podcast you're about to listen to includes cursing and talking about hoo-hahs. Please be advised. We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hello, everybody. And joining us today is Jamila Bay. Jamila is a journalist and public speaker. She was host of the Sex, Politics, and Religion Spar with Jamila Bay on the Voice of Russia radio. Uh, she wrote for the She the People blog on the Washington Post. Spoke at the Conservative Political Action Conference, or CPAC for short, earlier this year as an atheist and as an African-American woman. And right now she's in the, I guess, down season uh, for freelance journalism. (laughs) Jamila, welcome to Atheist Nomads. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. You've you've done a lot of of really cool stuff. Uh, Holy shit, you know. How did you get started in all of this? Uh, well, as I said at CPAC, I was born a poor black child. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> oh, wait, no, that wasn't me. That was Steve Martin. Steve Martin. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, no, I, I, I was born in the 70s. Everything was open to me. I could do anything. I could be anything. And rather than choose, I am someone who says, oh, this looks good. Let me go and try this, try that. Um, I always, I never played with Barbie as a child, but I always wanted to be her because she could do everything. Um, you know, it, yeah, Barbie has everything and I'm sure one day I might get a beach house in Malibu but I just thought it was cool that she was an astronaut and a president and a this and a that and she had the beautiful little boyfriend and you know I figured okay I'll, I'll do that so I have uh, I've done journalism which has let me learn a lot about a bunch of different things. I've played professional women's football. I've had a baby. I've had a husband. I've carried two mortgages. I mean, uh, you got to stop for just a second. Professional fucking football. Damn right. I was a D line tackle for the DC divas and, uh, I looked so good. I mean, I was tasty looking. I looked so good. That's where the baby came from. Fucking A. Nice. (laughs) Yeah, I'm I'm very good at hitting people, <laughs> and I'm hard to knock over. So it it you know who knew there was a um, yeah, it's something else. So how I even got into football is that um a long long time ago there was this uh, hardcore workout thing called CrossFit, and there were about a dozen gyms in the country doing it, and. I could call up any of the coaches, people who's who are like celebrities and millionaires now because they've trained the cast of 300 and all these other Hollywood people or, you know, they've got gyms that are invitation only and they live in a bunker in Utah and only come out to like do seminars and you know, all this, these were just people who I could get on the phone and talk to at the time. And I wrote a story for the Washington Post about hallucinating through a workout where I was going between boxing rounds and swinging kettlebells. And, you know, most people would go to the doctor or something, but no, I sat down and I wrote about it. (laughs) So I got a call from a guy who said, I manage the DC Divas. And I said, what is that? He said, oh, they're a women's pro football team. And I said, I don't know how to play football. And he said, oh, don't worry, we'll teach you. I said, oh, okay, whatever. (laughs) So I'm up for anything. And I figured, hey, George Plimpton did Paper Lion. I could do something like that. This is a great story. I'll go. So I show up and we run and we jump and we throw stuff or whatever. And, um, we do drills where, you know, they push us and we push them and la, 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 la. 
And uh, at one point, this this girl, I mean, she's, I mean, we were all over 18, so we're women, but I, she pissed me off, so I wanted to use some pejorative, so I think girl would do. Um, this girl slaps me on the ass. Like and yeah, I mean, just out of nowhere. And I'm like, oh, no, you didn't do that. And my husband is right here. Oh, we got a problem. And so I knocked <laughs> her over. <laughs> and like 40 women stand in there. Everybody went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, damn. I have befouled the leader. I'm going to have to try and escape with my life now. But that's not exactly what it was. Uh, Tank, who was a little more than 400 pounds, I think, uh, had never been knocked over, ever. And the whole team and the management of the team watched me do it. (laughs) <laughs> and so <laughs> they're like, we got somebody on the D-line. I was like, what the, what's a D-line? <laughs> they're like, oh, that's defense. I'm like, well, of course, defense. Did you see her smack my ass? <laughs> and nobody was interested in that. They were just like, oh, come on, come here. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So um, I, uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that experience. I, I I trained and I got in good shape and I trained some more and got in better shape. And if I ever gave up chocolate, I probably would have had a probably a four pack. But I have no interest in ever giving up chocolate. So I don't know what I if I ever did the diet right, what I what I would have wound up doing. But um, I enjoyed that so much. One of the things that really has stayed with me is that, you know, I, I travel through life. I'm a black woman. I am I am one of few in many of the situations in which I find myself. On this particular team, though, there were probably 65 of us and only 20 identified as, you know, purely hetero. And I was one of that 20, one of that 20. And to be in a place where my sexuality cast me as a minority. It, it was a position I'd never been in before. Yeah. And, and um, it was it was really enlightening and eye opening, particularly because I've learned that no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, no matter who you're partnered with, when you go home and you lay down with somebody and you love that person, you are sick of them. <laughs> No matter what, we all bitch about who we are with. We are all sick to hell of the person that we have promised ourselves to be with. And uh, I'm like, yay, that's pretty universal. We are all the same. Unity. Oh, man, I've always totally agreed with that. I mean, like, I've always said, you know, everybody should be able to get married and be completely miserable. Totally. 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 But, yeah, that, that would have been a... <laughs> I, I can relate to the experience of, of realizing you're a minority for the first time. Well, not, I guess in your case, not necessarily a minority for the first time, but in that particular category. Uh, that happened to me when I went to uh, the Seventh Avenue uh, Seminary in Michigan, and the majority of people, they were black. Mm-hmm. And biggest group there was from uh, people from Caribbean descent, and it was... It was kind of surprising for me, and uh, you learn to adapt very quickly. <laughs> yeah, the world isn't only as you've been told it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so it's uh, it 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 was a really enlightening and uh, eye-opening experience in a lot of ways. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and then how did you get into to journalism? Was that before or after the football? Oh, oh, that was totally, um, well, before the football, um, the football, I figured, you know, George Plimpton was good enough to play football for the, uh, Harvard team. So I, I tried to channel his dead ass and it didn't really work. But, um, you know, I, uh, I literally tripped and fell into journalism because I went to a school that had, uh, two radio, st- two radio stations that I knew of. And, uh, I needed a job at one point. 
back in the long ago days where minimum wage was three dollars and thirty five cents. Yeah. Three thirty five. Wow. You worked three hours. You still didn't make ten bucks. So, um, well, you did technically, but, you know, after taxes. Anyway, whatever. What I'm saying is <laughs> it was a long time ago. And uh, I set up an interview through the work study people and I showed up and I got got off the elevator and I went left and I literally walked into the oldest grad student I had ever seen in my life. And I was like, Hey, I'm here for the interview. He's like, Oh, okay. Well, Oh, okay. Uh, and he looked at his watch. He said, okay, fine. And we can do it now. And I'm like, what the, whatever. I'm like late, but fine. Okay. <laughs> and, um, we, I, I've always been a total news junkie, and I'm, I'm from Pittsburgh. Go Steelers. Steelers is my religion. Pull a malu if you sneeze. And uh, I went through this interview where he, he, I got asked questions like, how do you pronounce this word? And I said, oh, of course, I say it the right way. Carnegie. Not the way those New Yorkers think it is, because there is no hall like Carnegie. It is Carnegie. And he's like, okay, fine, we'll say this river, Monongahela, Susquehanna. I know all this. I'm, I live there. Um, and uh, the conversation turned to the upcoming election. And I said, everybody thinks this guy is going to win. But he just gave a speech the other day. He pissed off blacks. He pissed off labor. He pissed off women. There's no way he's going to win. It's going to be close. I said he was going to lose by eight points. And um, so long story short, the election happens. Exactly what I said was going to take place did. This seated congressman lost by eight points. The election was on a Tuesday. My interview had been the, pre- the preceding Thursday. The next Wednesday morning, I got a call. You'll be in the newsroom. I said, nice. okay, fine. I need a job. You're paying. I'll take it. So, which uh, presidential candidate was that? Oh, that yeah. was not. That was oh, Carter. That was no wasn't president. It? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, C- Carter. I was. I was. I was pretty political when Carter was president too. But you know, I I, I wasn't allowed to um, stay up past eight then, so <laughs> I could only. I could only wax poetic till dinner and then I had to get get in the tub. So, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, uh, Carter. Yeah. He's, he's still with us and I'm, I'm glad despite the Christian love sending him death threats, you know, but good man, that Carter. Right. So which president was that? Uh, I don't think, let me think for a second. That would have been, Oh, that actually would have been an off year. Oh, okay. That would have, yeah, there would have been no presidential race the year I'm talking about. Um, could it have been when, now I'm thinking about it. Well, I was talking about a congressional race, however, I... I do believe that might have been 96 when Clinton won his uh-huh. second term. Yeah, yeah. That was I. Oh, wait, have I been a new? Oh, my God. Yeah, it would have been 96. Push wow. okay, so, it was, so it was Bob Dole. Almost 20. Is it, yeah. uh, Bob Dole. Bob Dole, Bill Clinton. Oh, yeah. Oh, Bob man. Dole, like Bob Dole approves this message. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. When flying was a pleasure and (laughs) computers were things you went to laboratories to use (laughs) and your dot matrix printer that still needed you to rip the sides off of the, the paper. So it fed through the printer was still a thing. Oh yes. The olden days. (laughs) All right. Well, at this point we're actually going to take a, Real quick break, and then we'll be right back. Geeks Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. 
That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. All right. So, uh, which, uh, what, what news organization were you in the newsroom with? Way back then, I uh, got my start at WDUQ FM 90.5 Hot News Cool Jazz. And up next on Fresh Air, talking to Terry Mo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I- Oh man, I just had a I was trying out. not said, to what, laugh. What did you ask? What? What? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what were you saying? I just I went into a trance of some sort. Yeah, no. Um, uh, WDUQ FM no longer exists in Pittsburgh. The employees made a bid to try and buy it. They were doing too much uh, news that the very conservative leaning Catholic uh, owner of the station at the Catholic College, well, you know. University. Um, they they didn't like the fact that there was all this talk about lady parts and reproductive stuff, and there wasn't enough Catholic perspective on the station there. So the charter went up for sale. The employees made a bid to buy it. They came up with a few million dollars and well, many millions of dollars, and said, "Hey, we'd like to buy this and keep it going." And the school took a lower bid from another group that was led by the attorney that the employees originally secured to try and broker a deal. So the attorney turned tail, went to the enemy, lower bid, took over the station. And uh, so everybody kind of scattered. And there is another station that's... I don't even know if it's still in the same facilities or what, but, um, yeah, WDUQFM doesn't exist anymore. And, um, Mm. here's how long ago I worked there. I used to have to do, you know, if you're interested in learning more about the station and how you can be part, visit us on the World Wide Web at www dot wait http colon backslash backslash <laughs> www dot wduq dot duq dot edu once again yeah so like uh, uh yeah say that hungover at six thirty in the morning and then you'll prove your broadcast <laughs> your broadcast cred to me <laughs> yeah and then have to come in and talk about what's going on on the Monongahela River. <laughs> So, Monongahela? Monongahela, yes. Monongahela. Yeah, and that's in this country? (laughs) (laughs) Indeed, and if you add the Ohio and the Allegheny to uh, to that, uh, you have the three rivers where a stadium once stood. Yeah, right over my head. Ah, oh, ghost stealers. Ghost stealers. <laughs> That's all I say. You know. The Southerners say, bless your heart. I say, ghost stealers. <laughs> uh, well, Southerners say, bless your heart when they mean to say, fuck you. Ghost stealers. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, uh, uh, <laughs> so definitely an atheist. When did you, where were you raised religious? How, how did, what? I'm what a black woman you? in America. What? kind of question is that were you right of course <laughs> jesus know, is on there's... the wall with martin luther king jr I'm, and I'm sure grandma yes of, i'm sure uh, there's one family that does didn't have religion yeah they, they and i did not meet them until i grew up um i was raised by a southern baptist who converted to catholicism and raised me catholic um, my dad was um uh, he was raised as a Muslim, and he he didn't practice by the time he and my mom got married and whatever, but uh, we didn't eat pork growing up. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I was, I was raised really, really Catholic, went to Catholic school, um, lived at Catholic church, went to Catholic college. Um, I was, and, and the reason why is because it never made any sense to me. I never bought it. So clearly it was my fault. Clearly it was my lack of faith. I kept finding questions to ask that nobody could answer. So clearly it was, my heart had not been opened. So I studied more and I had more questions and I asked more questions. Then I realized none of you bleepity bleepers know what the bleep you're talking about. So leave me the hell alone. I'm 
just going to stay home on Sundays, watch my football, watch football in my underpants. And that's what I do. Were you just saying (laughs) go Steelers over and over? (laughs) (laughs) Again and again and again, like a mantra, like, (laughs) yes, like a mantra. (laughs) You say it till you transcend and you get another ring. (laughs) (laughs) So about how old were you when you, you quit? I realized I didn't believe the the crap when I was uh I I started doubting at four. I realized um <laughs> well, well what ha- okay so what had happened was uh my father has the world's most distinctive handwriting. Um now as an adult I understand that he he clearly had studied Spencerian script. Um, but he had a hybrid of it. A couple of the letters are very similar. Um, but it, you see the man write you a note once, you know his handwriting for the rest of your life. <laughs> and when I saw that dad signed his name just like Santa signed his name, I was so <laughs> proud of myself. And I was like, I figured it out. Yeah, you're, there's no Santa Claus. You, you. And, and I saw my, all, my, you know, my parents' eyes got wide. And I have a sister who's a decade older and her eyes got wide. And, and my father started spinning, you know, uh, oh, well, Santa was busy and he asked me to sign all the gift tags this <laughs> year. So, And I'm thinking Santa Claus is magic and he thinks to ask you for help. you know. And, and I realized these people thought I was stupid. These people thought that I was dumb enough to just believe what was clearly bull- bullshit. And I, I have never trusted anybody since. I, <laughs> I realized, I mean, I didn't have the language for it at four years old, but I, I, I can tell you, I remember recognizing that I was never going to believe anybody who had, uh, who had motivation to make me behave as they saw fit. Uh, if, if, if you couldn't explain something to me in a way that made sense to me, well, I wasn't going to believe you because the minute I stopped believing in Santa, the minute I had to stop being good. And, <laughs> and I could, I saw through it. And, and then, you know, you know, this God thing, it's like, okay, well, you know, let me, let me figure this out. I, I, it doesn't make sense to me. Okay. But you know, everybody can't be lying about it. So it's, it's, it must be me. What am I doing wrong what am i not believing why isn't god revealing himself to me because he doesn't exist he's 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 a figment of our imagination he's he's a way to control people uh whatever i i just i have no use for it i have no need for it and and i and i haven't i i haven't had such a need even even as a little kid so everybody else you know, feels the feels the spirit moving them and feels the power and the majesty and the love. And much like one of my favorite musicals, nothing, I was feeling nothing at all ever. So it was just, uh, yeah, it was to make me behave in accordance with the way the people wanted me to. And I don't behave for anybody. Definitely another system of control just made for children. (laughs) Indeed. Mm. (laughs) So, all right. So you, you had the, the, the doubt there and, uh, but you made it through Catholic university. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Is that because it was a school or because it was a religious school? Um, I had a lot of, wonderful experiences at college. I enjoyed my college experience, but I get restless with anything that prescribes for me what I'm supposed to be doing. Hmm. Um, and so it, it, it was time to move on. I got a job offer and I thought to myself for all of a minute, oh, do I keep paying to learn to get a job or do I take a job that I want that's at the time it was my dream job and I was like yeah 
peace out. See you people later. I'm, I'm going to go work for NPR. And I did. And I spent a decade there. Fuck. Nice. Yeah. I was also a five and a half year senior at that time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't like, I mean, we're not talking about, oh, I'm a sophomore and a half now. No, I was, I, I was tired. I was, I was done. <laughs> And the funny, the funny thing is, is that I took all of my, uh, as a freshman and a sophomore, I took all of my 400 level classes and 300 level classes, and I had to appeal to every professor. And you know, everybody's like, "Well, you haven't taken any of the prereqs." I'm going, "Look, I don't want to get to be a senior and realize I hate political science or I'm not interested in communications." And I didn't take general communications. I kind of cobbled together a political rhetoric concentration. I studied the speeches of all of these dead Greek people whose names I still can't pronounce properly. And uh, I looked at the way speakers, uh, beyond just oratory, the way speakers engage with audiences. And so everything I was doing was sort of preparing me to broadcast or talk about politics and i i enjoyed it it was good for me i did it for a long time and then i was like screw this i'm gonna go make some money instead of paying out all the time we love hearing from our listeners you can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com tweet us at atheist nomads send us a message on our facebook page at facebook.com slash atheist nomads or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. All right, I got I to gotta know. So you spoke at CPAC. Mm-hmm. Would you actually, how would you, where would you put yourself on the political scale? Like left? Standing to the side of it. Standing to whichever. Actually, no, I'm not standing to the side of it. If that scale is is flush with a wall, I'm standing in front of the scale. I'm not. Uh, let let me be real clear, because there, you know, there are a whole lot of people who know what I am and whatever. And, um, you know, I come from I come from Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. and I grew up in the '80s, and you know. Uh, uh, The thing about it is there was a time where you could, in this country, look at a person and you couldn't tell what their political bent was by what they looked like. There was a time where Republicans and Democrats argued how to feed hungry American kids, not whether to. Mm -hmm. (laughs) There was a time where Catholics and Catholic bishops and Catholic politicians said, well, We don't believe that birth control is a good thing, but we understand that there's a larger issue here. You know, the autonomy of women and and people who aren't Catholic can determine for themselves whether to believe the one true pope in Rome or, you know, Boy City or wherever. I don't know where Vatican City is what I was thinking of. I don't know why Boy City came out. (laughs) Anyhow. Because they like boys. Pope. Oh, that, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so for me, I don't know where I belong because I live in this tiny little hamlet that is Washington, D.C. And, and I don't have senators. My congresswoman, who I think is a great person, Eleanor Holmes Norton, she is an institution. She is someone with, I I believe as best one can, I think she has the interest of her constituency at heart. But to be honest, for the, you know, the only time, the, there's been one time in history that a legislator was denied the opportunity to speak before Congress on legislation that directly impacts the legislated. And it was Eleanor Holmes Norton who was blocked by a whole bunch of men. I'm looking at you, Darrow Ice of California in particular, you bleep. Um, you know, she was blocked from talking 
about the need to to not institute a 20 week abortion ban in the District of Columbia. Um, I don't have any political power where I live. And while I don't live in a place where machine politics is a thing, I also don't live in a place where I am welcomed by either. I, I, there, I'm welcome. People like me. I tend to get on well. But Democrats real quickly will be like, oh, you're an atheist. Uh. Republicans real quickly will be like, oh, wow, wow. You, you know, you, you sure you you sure you're not one of those Muslims? And yes, <laughs> I'm, I'm not using hyperbole. I'm, ta- I'm talking about my own individual lived experience. So um, if I lived in a different if, if, if all politics is local, if I lived in most places in this country, I would easily check aside. Here in D.C., I really, you know, I, I, I kind of don't belong anywhere. Um, there's a D.C. statehood party. I agree with a lot of what they're talking about. I think, oh, yeah. I think New Columbia needs to be a state. The D.C. Green Party does some really progressive stuff, and they are talking about child care as a platform? Hell yes. I've got a young child. It is more expensive to raise a child in Washington, D.C. than it is to raise a child in Manhattan, New York. Damn. Check my facts. I'm right. Wow. <laughs> that study came out. I didn't believe it. I read. I, I went through. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's not close. It's not close. It's, it's cheaper to raise a kid in Manhattan than in Washington, D.C., where I live. Um, I'm the mother of a little black boy. I have a lot of concern about education and public education because I'm I am not I'm not somebody who who tries to go on emotion as much as I try to go on what facts I have at hand and the facts show me the facts show me that charter schools are not the panacea they're being sold to be uh the evidence is in the evidence is clear charter schools are indistinguishable from public schools and charter schools get to kick kids out and they get to take whatever money they want mm-hmm. so so when i am this pro public school and i live in dc and i look at the candidates who are as pro public school and as skeptic against charter school a whole bunch of those are one side. Hmm. Whole, th- so for me, you know, who's trying to vote this issue or that, I spoke at CPAC to say, and if you listen to my speech, you know, there are a whole lot of people go, oh, she's a Republican and, and, you know, screw her and she's a horrible person. Okay, fine. If, if your life is such that because somebody disagrees with you, they're a horrible person, screw them to hell with them. Okay, fine. That's your <laughs> life. However, I never said what I am because I, I haven't been, I, I'm at the dance and I'm going to, I'm going to put on the first ring that presents itself to me and looks good to me. And I, I'd feel it out. Nobody's offering me a ring yet. I'm only at a dance mixing with people, and I will dance with anybody who asks. By dance, I mean talk to, listen to, engage with, question. Um, I said, give me a reason to vote for you. Let's do this as Americans. Why is that a bad thing to ask anybody who's trying to who's trying to represent me in this democracy why be why should i have been pilloried by saying i'm part of a growing conservative family do you know who my sister just married my family just got bigger because there are a bunch of republican people who are related to the guy she married I love these people. They're my family. I'm not going to say, oh, I don't care for you because we disagree. I'm going to get in your face and make your Thanksgiving miserable. <laughs> you know, I might give you a crappy Christmas present if I if I pull you in the grab bag. I might give you a T-shirt with a candidate on it I know you can't stand. <laughs> but, you know, 
the stakes are too high. I am a black person in America. I live in a police state. If a cop anywhere in this country, and if I encounter that person and they've got on a badge and they're wearing a uniform, I am a second class citizen at best. And this happens in a lot of democratic jurisdictions. This happens in a lot of blue states, happens in just as many red states too. I want to find the people who are who care about my issues. I want to find the people who understand that I am a fully human person, that I have every right to participate fully in this democracy. I want to find people who understand that as a woman, I have medical needs that should be discerned by me, my doctor and the you know, and the the medical boards, not me and whoever happened to get voted in in that particular district in which I live. Hell yeah. And you can't have those conversations when you go, oh, well, what box do you check? I'm not talking to you at all. Blah, 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 blah. blah. I can't hear you. That's that's idiocy. Mm-hmm. And so for me, yeah, I I spoke at CPAC, did a damn good job at it, too. Yeah. Uh, had a lot of good conversations, got a lot of cell phone numbers of people who um, I'm not even going to name drop because I'll be considered a liar. And I don't I don't <laughs> you know, I'm only at the dance. I'm not I'm not telling anything. But um, <laughs> you don't get to mix with people who can actually make change if you refuse refuse to get in there and mix with people who mm-hmm. make change. If you don't go, they cannot say, if, if they invite you and you don't go, they cannot be blamed for not asking you back. When you say, hey, I will come, and they say, okay, fine, and then you show up, they've got to be decent to you. Now, does this mean that, you know, oh, everything is great in Kumbaya? No. But, you know, what? Well, it means that, um, I, I I feel like there are conversations that have begun. There are considerations that are being made. And um, whether or not you liked it, uh, the, the head of CPAC had to stand up in front of all of the most conservative people. Uh, again, conser- you know what? First of all, conservative and liberal, nobody actually knows what they mean in this country. They are (laughs) labels that have been taken and co-opted and some more so than others. But frankly, um, what is a conservative and what is a Republican is just unidentifiable in much of this country anymore. Um, But anyhow, so the the head of CPAC had to get up and talk about, you know, all Americans, those, you know, of faith and those with no faith at all. (laughs) First time in the history that that's ever happened. And I was there and I made it happen. So, you know, write angry blogs about me. I don't give whatever. Like until you're until you're going to write me a check. I don't care what your thoughts are. <laughs> you know, but when you look at it, uh, the direction the Republican Party is headed right now, uh-huh. it has to change or it will die. <laughs> yeah. It can't and, keep and, and, falling apart. <laughs> now, you know, President Carson would probably disagree with you. <laughs> And I'm sure that President Trump would also Mm -hmm. not really believe what you're saying. Yeah, you know. I I don't think President Trump would care. uh, President Trump would have to care because President Trump is, is, is part of, you know, whether or not the checks and balances are working as well as they were intended. They do exist. And President Trump cannot rule, cannot govern, cannot legislate in a vacuum. And um, as we've seen, if Congress is against the president, nothing goes. Mm -hmm. So anything that's going to bring about political evolution. Trust me, I feel that. I'm the government employee here. When they don't, uh, (laughs) nothing gets done, I don't get paid. Yeah. uh, Hey, I'm I'm in D.C. I mean, the, the, the need for... Yeah, yeah. When 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 Congress decides they're gonna not show up, everybody from the tax 
taxis that drive, well, Ubers now, yay, go Uber. You know, again, I'm a black person who couldn't get taxis to stop for me. So I am all about the app drivers. Um, you know, they're, they're great for me. <laughs> but, but, you know, taxis don't drive. Hot dog stands don't sell. Restaurants don't book. Uh, you know, all of the businesses around the institution that is our government at work, they stop too. And for, for people who don't even really have to work a full week, <laughs> um, I'm talking about the, the congressional folks who are elected, um, you know, making other people lose pay because you are mad <laughs> or you are towing that party line because you've been told to, that's not democracy. That's, that's the way a toddler behaves. Yeah. You're, mm -hmm. you know, you're not digging in for a philosophical reason. You are, you're, you're being petulant. You know, there's, there's a, there's a distinction. So I, I, I think, um, I think this political, this, this political system under which we live is broken. I think this political system under which we live is flawed. Um, but that's so because it's made up of people. And I'm not somebody, until you personally do me wrong, until you do me harm, until you support the people who have actually done me wrong, and that does point to a lot of legislators, um, I'm not going to totally cut you off. If you say, okay, here, we extend you an invitation here. We want to hear more about what you're talking about. We want to know about something to which you have insight, I'll go talk, fine. If you like the show, consider giving us some financial support. We make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. One dollar an episode is all we ask. Please think of the kittens. You know, I'm coming from a place where one of my local reps. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about uh, Joe Kennedy, the the uh, football assistant football coach that was praying on the 50 yard line. Oh, at him. least. Oh, yeah. The Freedom from Religion Foundation sent him a nice letter. Yeah, they did. I've been I've been a part mm -hmm. of that from the beginning, and uh, one one of my mm -hmm. local reps that's a good friend of his. Um, took me aside and uh, witnessed to me for about an hour and a half. So you let that go on that long? I'm caught, too caught. nice. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh we had we had yeah, some good back and go forth off but line with this, but yeah, oh. We we, we had some, we had some good back and forth, but in essence, yeah, when he was talking to me all all this time he was witnessing to me. Oh, wow, you poor Can can I give you a little bit of unsolicited advice, please? <laughs> Yeah, just, by all just, means. Okay, seriously, like I'm, uh, yeah, I, I have to admit, I lean toward the assholeish. I do. It's my nature. It's my charm. It's what I do. But whenever I found myself in a position where I don't want to like just come out and go total hammer on somebody, yeah, I just like to say, well, you know, I have read the Bible, and that story of Sodom and Gomorrah just really touched my heart. You know, the fact that out of all the people to save, God didn't save a man who only had sex with one of his daughters. He got he had sex with both of them and got them pregnant. Now, I don't believe that a father should impregnate both of his daughters. And That's I cool. can't be I, well, you know, I, I, I just I don't believe that. And so I can't be I, I can't subscribe to a philosophy that says the best man in a city is the one who impregnated both of his daughters. I just, it's, it's creepy to me. It's weird. I can't, I, I just, I, I have nothing to do with it. I, can you tell me why you believe that? <laughs> why do you support that? You know, <laughs> what, what's what, what, getting his daughters pregnant? Why do you, is, is that something that's what God wants people to aspire to? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have never, I have never, and I've been using that one since minimum wage was three thirty-five. I have never had anybody who like would even entertain me beyond that ever. 
I even got <laughs> thrown out of a taxi once. I was like, dude, you can't throw me. Well, I'll go to this bar instead. I don't care. Fine. And I'm not paying you. <laughs> I'll tell I, you, though, I, I got to I'm going to stick out for myself, though. Uh, my my whole thing is that I wanted to hear if he would like put out some dirt on himself. I wanted to see mm. if, there was, if he would let anything slip. So I was trying to be all nice and oh, you know, I challenged him a little bit. You, but hey, okay, I, okay. So you should see here. Okay, where do you struggle? What if you? But but you're somebody who doesn't have to struggle with anything. You don't have anything that you don't. Have, this is easy for you. Yeah. How's he going to respond to that next time? <laughs> it's easy for you. What do you struggle with? You don't have anything. This this comes natural to you. <laughs> See what he says. Uh, if if you want. But then you might have to sit through another 45 minutes, so uh, maybe no. not. Come on. I was alone in the dark with this kind of creepy guy <laughs> next to a football field. Oh, good. Yeah, oh, that, for like 45 minutes in the dark. You've, you've done your penance. Just you're, you're absolved. You're done. Thank you. Thank you. Mecca like a hiney ho. Pala malu. <laughs> Mecca hiney. <laughs> like a high Mecca chani ho. <laughs> hazmat, hazmat, you are washed to clean. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> oh, us children of Pee Wee. <laughs> uh, Netflix has the Pee Wee Herman Christmas special on it. Oh. Katie Lang in her dress, Little Richard, Charo. Remember the Del Rubio triplets, the the <laughs> senior ladies in like no pants who play? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh man, they were in that, and uh, you know, I mean, come on, cow- Morpheus is Cowboy Curtis. Fuck yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. It took me. It like even now, I I half expect them to come a uh, hot. Pee wee, no matter what he's doing. I mean, watch it, watching Boys in the Hood. I was half expecting Paul Rubin to pop, pop up at well, Pee Wee Herman at any point to pop up, you know, but never did. Never oh man, did. that's back in the days when he still called himself Larry Fishburne. Oh yes, yes indeed. Um, yeah, yeah. It, oh man, uh, yes. So anyhow, <laughs> for a happy holiday season, get you some Pee Wee. It's awesome. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh boy. I, I keep hearing he's coming back, so I can't wait. I oh, can't it, HBO it's good. showtime. Adult version. He did an HB he did it was he one did of those. do an, he a came, special like a year did ago. One, yes. And um and supposedly the, the show show was coming back, so we'll see. Yeah. Um you know, too bad Phil Hartman won't be with him, but you know, it's what happens when you marry a murderess, I guess. You get murderedest. Yeah. Did I cross a line there making a murder joke? I'm <laughs> no, no, you did not. Not too soon. Okay, no. very well. Yeah. All right, so we're we're starting to get low on time. So what are you working on now? Uh, I got a couple of things in the fire. Um, you know what? Everybody who's interested in finding out what the hell I'm doing next should definitely follow me on Twitter. Um, I am at jbay. J-B-E-Y, four letters, J-B-E-Y. There we go. Um, and I will often, uh, as our president uh, likes to say, I will pop off on Twitter sometimes. Um, what I've got coming up, I'm in the early, early super, can't even announce it, pre-stage fundraising for a documentary about African Americans in the STEM fields uh, in modern day. So this mm. isn't George Washington Carver and his peanuts. He was a brilliant scientist. Uh, my people come from Alabama, the smaller city right outside Tuskegee. Hey, I'm not talking bad about Dr. Carver. I'm just saying there's more than just him. You know, George, mm-hmm. Wa- <laughs> you know, <laughs> George Washington Carver is kind of like the Martin Luther King of black science. There's other people. Okay, um, yeah. so um, I'm going to be doing that with somebody who is a current TED fellow, and she is a very lovely person who is a uh, who's an evolutionary biologist, and uh, she is super cute. Of oh, course, she's of course she's 
brilliant and intelligent and whatever. She's just real easy on the eyes too. Just putting that there. <laughs> so um, I'll be I'll be working on that. Uh, I'm gonna be covering 2016. I don't quite know what markets just yet. The beauty, it you know, it, it's a good thing. It's a bad thing that I'm a freelancer because I get to write for anybody. I get to cover whatever I want, and then I'm I'm pretty good at pitching. I know how to sell a story. Um, so I, I'll be doing some of that, and uh, I don't really know where I'll pop up. I'm sure I'll do something else for MSNBC. I uh, don't know what that's going to be, but um, I have reason to th- think, and this is, uh, I, I have reason to think that uh, um, if there were to be a work of some sort about African Americans and the GOP in modern day. I probably have already done some writing and done the interviews for that. If I okay. was going to do anything, just you know, hypothetically. You know, <laughs> with with 2016, there's it. Sh- the the next couple months should be quite interesting. While the the viable, actually viable candidates get sorted out. Mm-hmm. Well, then I, it should get I real good. Sh- I hedge all my bets until Valentine's Day. Yep. I'm just putting that out there right now. It like you can't even say this is the Wild West. Like in the Wild West, everybody had guns and they kind of knew how to quick draw and they could kind of shoot what they were aiming at. We are like dealing with people with tasers and stun guns and uh real guns and fake guns and there are a couple people with fingers going toot toot so it's just <laughs> it, it, i don't you can't make heads or tails of it you cannot make heads or tails of it right now um it, it, it's just this is unprecedented actually it's not if you go back to the 1800s and you look at the way campaigns were run back then when everybody was just kind of crazy um you, you do see but nobody's gonna do that because we can barely remember the election cycle previous to the one where it end but uh yeah this is uh this is some wild and woolly stuff and not all of it's reality based so I'm just going to say, let's get to Valentine's Day, and then I'll start saying, okay. Um, <laughs> just now did Payush Jindal, who insists that people call him oh, Bobby, Bobby, even though he's a grown man. Come on, I, he's I, a southern I, boy. I can't call a grown man I did not grow up with Bobby. I just can't. You know Bobby? No, no, I'm sorry. I'm either having <laughs> Hank Hill flashbacks or like when I was a child. No. Um, oh, come on. He's a good Mama American. Co- did you know that? Yeah, he's tanned. He's so tanned, in fact, <laughs> that it never comes off. That's tan. Hmm. Okay, if you think Bobby's bad, the governor of my state goes by Butch. <sighs> that was on the I ballot. A, it was I actually a, on the ballot for governor. I had a doggy called Butch once. <laughs> and. Anyhow, yeah, I again, you know, how about we? Yeah, I mean, again, these infantilized names. It's like, come on, dude. And 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 if you want to be like, well, well, I mean, Jimmy Carter was Jimmy's. I'm sorry, Jimmy. Okay, fine, whatever. But Jimmy is manlier than Bobby as a name. I'm sorry, it just I find it so. I, I, I just don't so. like that he. You know, feels he he needs to take an Americanized name, or yeah. that he, or that he stole well, his his well, freaking uh, tanned and rested ready from Nixon, didn't he? I don't know where the tanned, rested, and ready comes from. If that's I don't know if that's Nixon, but I will tell you that Bobby comes from Bobby Brady. Uh, Payush watched the Brady Bunch as a child and got all excited about being an American boy, just like Bobby. And like, okay, Jimmy Carter, his name was James, is, his name is James Earl. Jimmy is the diminutive of James. William Jefferson Clinton, Bill is the diminutive of William. Sure. Bobby ain't the diminutive of Payush. <laughs> I, I am not. I, my Desi friends have, and I have asked them, my Desi friends, a few of them who speak Hindi or Bengali, have told me, no, no, we don't have Bobbies when we name our children Paiush. We just don't. <laughs> so um, I've, I've looked into it because I, 
I don't want to be ethnocentric, but uh, I think um, the pejor- I, I, I think in the vernacular, it's bitch, please. Um, no, I, I'm not <laughs> Paiute. Nimrata Haley out of South Carolina. Okay. I will concede that Nikki is a little closer to Nimrata, but um, again, you know. Uh, for, why don't you go with like for, Nini? Uh, yeah, seriously. <laughs> seriously. Like, I mean, you can't tell me that there aren't nicknames in every country and culture and people. If you want to Americanize your name, um, I guess everybody whose name is black, whose people came here and were called Schwartz, you know, fine. It happens. It's, you know, first generations do that. Um, but when I, when I get strip searched at the airport because my name is a blatantly Muslim name and I, hear people laughing at names that are meaningful to folks in my culture, whether or not you can spell them correctly. And, you know, that's not the point. (laughs) The point I'm trying to make is I think you're being, I think you're being anti you. I think to try and be Bobby Brady or Nicki Minaj, or whoever, Nikki Haley, I don't know. Um, you have beautiful names. Why, why try and hide behind bastardized American versions of them? Damn if Condoleezza right. can be Condoleezza, okay? Well, Get over here, Payush. Actually, you know what? Payush isn't in the race anymore, so have a drink and relax. You've <laughs> done it or you haven't done it or you, I don't know. Hallmark doesn't make a card about what you say to somebody who just dropped out of a presidential race, you know? So I guess it's better than Palin, you know, why quit while you're there? You never <laughs> even went for it. Yeah. Yeah. Jindal, uh, he, he ha- gave it, gave it a half ass try. <laughs> yeah. I guess he, he tanned too long and rested too much. Yeah. Oh goodness. <laughs> and, uh, it actually looks like uh, this tan rusted ready was from the 1988 RNC. Uh, yeah, because somebody who's already literally brown calling oneself tanned is well, not diminishing the fact that you're already a deeper than tan color. I mean, well, dude. if you if you look up that picture from his uh, governor's mansion, his, oh, his self portrait. Yeah, the white so, dude there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, so, the, you know, the, the, the white dude that's probably, I mean, the, the one that's, how do you, how do you say, uh, millennially, cha- millennially challenged or something? I don't know. <laughs> he, he looks, th- that, 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 that's a disgrace. That he is literally anemic. whitewashing, white faced. Yes, he does look anemic, you know. It, it looks like somebody, said uh, hey uh hey governor um the governor's mansion's on fire the color that he would probably turn on hearing the worst news he's ever heard uh, maybe that was the picture they drew and then mm-hmm. lightened still you don't turn that I'm, I'm, it, uh, maybe has michael jackson's doctor no conrad murray's <laughs> license was taken I, I can't i can't figure it out i'm confused I'm there's just, there's I'm white confused. and there's pale those are very mm-hmm. different. Mm-hmm. And Bobby is neither of those. Yeah. And yeah. Pale just looks sick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No offense, Wesley. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> uh, well, this has been fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's time for, for the official close. So uh, you, you've plugged your Twitter and uh, the link to that will be in the show notes. Um, Super, yeah. I will also put a link to your Wikipedia page because it's awesome that you have a Wikipedia page. Ah, uh, yay. <laughs> Go to face <laughs> it. <laughs> With your CPAC picture on it. Uh, yeah. yeah that, uh, I, I, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> well, Jamila, thank you very much for joining us. It has been my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And for our listeners, we'll be back next week with news. 
Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find show notes and contact information at atheistnomads.com. Follow us on Twitter at Atheist Nomads and like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Atheist Nomads. Please subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcatcher of choice. And while you're there, feel free to leave us a review. Theme music is courtesy of Sturdy Fred. Until next time, this has been the Atheist Nomads.